do have really one more person coming, but no. we want to get the show on the road. We have a, a, a lot of speakers, a lot of information. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, so thanks for coming. My name is Samantha. Thanks for coming to Bear Pond Books for our workshop, Marketing Your Indie Book or Your Self-Published Book. Charlotte was so kind to point out to me that um, the field pr prefers the term indie for independent publishing rather than self-published. But whatever you're doing, we're here to help you do it better, hopefully. Um, we're happy to present this workshop in collaboration with the Galaxy Bookshop in Hardwick. They'll be having this same workshop tomorrow night. If you have any friends or know anyone that would like to take the workshop, you can send them up to the Galaxy Bookshop in Hardwick. I'd like to thank Ingram Spark and the Independent Publishers of New England for their generous support and resources to make tonight happen. I'd also like to thank Orca Media. They're here filming the event. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to watch that on both public access and we'll have it on the Bear Pond Books website. Um, let me tell you about a few upcoming Bear Pond Books events before we begin with this event. We have Transforming Trauma, How Sharing Stories Can Help Us Heal on March 13th. And on March 27th, we have a book group discussion about David Daly's Rat Fucked, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count. And that's <laughs> uh, facilitated by Norwich professor Edward P. E. Cohn. Um, so look for information about that in our newsletter or on Facebook or on Twitter. We're at Bear Pond Books. And you can go online at bearpondbooks.com. The format for tonight's event is that each panelist will speak for about five minutes. They'll introduce themselves, and they'll give advice for those of you who want to publicize your indie or self-published book. And then we'll take questions from the audience. So I ask that you please hold your questions until the question time. Um, I'd like to let you know the bathroom is at the back of the store, which is this way, and it's to the right. And the switch is outside. Oh, the switch. The, thank you. I forget to mention that. <laughs> the light switch is on the outside. <laughs> thank you, Serena. Um, our back door is locked, and so if you need to leave in an emergency, the front door is open. Or are we reversing that? No. I'll open. No, it'll be okay. <laughs> I have people. Um, and I ask that if you haven't already, please mute or turn off your cell phones. And I'd like to thank our panelists for coming. Let me uh, introduce to you briefly who we have tonight. We have Charlotte Pierce. I'm going to introduce her right here. She joins us from the Boston area, where she runs Pierce Press. Uh, and she helps authors make better books and sell more of them. <coughs> That's the goal. I try. We have Serena Fox. She's on the end. She's from Waitsfield. She's a publication designer with a background in branding and marketing. We have um, the author of award-winning Connor McBride series, Catherine Guar. She's also a member of the Alliance of Independent Authors and the Independent Publishers of New England. We have Bill Schubart. Many of you may know him from his VPR commentating. And he's a board member with IPNE and the acclaimed author of the Lamoille Stories, among others. And you may also know our very own Claire Benedict, the co-owner of Bear Pond Books since 2006. She's been in the bookstore business since she and her husband moved to Vermont in 2002 to purchase Rivendell Books. And we're extremely pleased to present this panel of experts. We hope you learn a lot from the marketing workshop. Let's begin with Charlotte. All right. Thank you. It's one of my favorite things to talk about because it's one of my favorite things to do. And how, how many people just love social media? <laughs> yeah? All right. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And how many people just d never do it? Is there anybody that never does it? Okay. Well, get over that because <laughs> you're going to have to do it if you're an independent publisher. Um, we we try and avoid the term uh, social or uh, self self publisher because it's it's got a lot of baggage about vanity press and you know just I guess it's more it's cooler to be an indie you know it's like anyway. Um, I started out in publishing and magazine publishing in Seattle and, and New York, and then I moved up to Boston and started Pierce Press. But uh, I've always been kind of a, a techie, um, adopting, an early adopter, I guess is what you call it. So, so um, I've been doing, and I, I included this this sheet. There's probably two hours worth of material here. So um, I think what what indie authors do when they think about social media, if they're not used to it or not familiar with it, is you, you kind of throw up your hands. There's just too much out there. There's just so much, 
so many options. And um, so I'm just going to give some recommendations of what, my, in my experience, can work uh, in terms of platforms for social media and, and an approach to social media. The general checklist here is probably the most important thing, but I have put down on each platform, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, your, your own blog is the most important thing. Your own blog or your own website, it's like owning, it's like owning your house. You know, it's, you, you're not depending on Facebook's algorithms to, I mean, it's, it's something that you control. So that's where you start. Um, and building a, building a platform, um, it, do people know what I mean about that, building an author platform? Yeah. It, you, no, go ahead and tell us. Tell us? Yeah. OK, tell you. Um, it's, it's like setting yourself up in business, hanging out your shingle. Everyone knows you, um, you've, you've connected with a lot of people on these different platforms. And it's something you can start to do right now, even if you have never written a word, if you don't have a manuscript. And if you have a book already, start now. <laughs> because when you, when you publish a new book, you'll be able to tap into those connections that you've made on social media. And, um, and so, so that's it's kind of you, you say, I've got a new book out, and 500 people are excited about it because they know you. Um, and I think one of the most important things to do on social media, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or um, Facebook or the main ones, YouTube's second um, is another option for you. And but is to be authentic. You know, it's, if you're a goat farmer, talk about goats, post pictures of goats. Um, if your book is about goat farming. Um, you know, paste, post funny pictures of goats jumping over turnstiles or, you know, just to be kind of, uh, to communicate that you're a real person, you're authentic, and people like to deal with, with that kind of <coughs> approach. Um, and let's see, there's, there's so much to, to talk about. How many people are on, have your own blog or website? Yeah. It's, I mean, then, the, you know, if you think I can't start my own, I don't know how to start my own blog or, or website, I mean, you, you can pick and choose. You can learn or you can hire somebody to do it. It's, there are lots of um, people out there uh, willing to help. I use WordPress on mine, PiercePress.com. If you go there, it's a WordPress. It's nice and clean. It's a lot of people know how to, how to do WordPress. But um, so I'm um, just trying to see, see what might be the most. Um, so get your blog going. Um, start po oh, the 80-20 rules is a really important part of, of building your platform. And I, I think other speakers talk about this in other disciplines. But it's 80% about other people and 80% about stuff that doesn't say, buy my book. And you know how annoying it is, you know, when people throw advertisers are throwing things at you, and they want you to buy something. They just want you to take. The, they want to separate you from their your money as soon as they possibly can. So, kind of building up yourself as like Anne is, you know, you've done that with Toxic Staple and your, you know, your gluten. You know, you, you know, you've yeah. done that. Yeah, I mean, I really admire that. Awesome. And, and it's, you know, your passion is evident. That's, I think that's what helps, um, helps, um, you know, establish loyal followers. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, take your time. Okay. You have a lot of time. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, I mean, and I'll talk to any one of you independently these are my business cards and if you want to call me about you know questions that come up um, do you want to mention here. the you know benefits of Twitter versus Instagram versus yeah, Facebook? What are they? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, Twitter is, is something that I've been working on. Um, and it's it's kind of hard to get your head around, but it's a it's uh. kind of an, it, they've recently upgraded from 140 to 200 140 to 280 characters. So you have more space to do things. Um, important things to do there are post images. Um, again, the 80/20 rule. Um, videos even, uh, and then in all this, another. Uh, great tool is a tool like Hootsuite. Does anybody use that? Hootsuite? You're, you're a star. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I live and breathe by, Hoot, by Hootsuite. It's, it aggregates all of my social media, or most of it, into one application. So I can post to Google+, I can post to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook pages all in that one interface. It's really a lifesaver. Highly recommend it. There are others, and there are free versions of these, all these programs, and there are pro versions. So um, if you're going to be doing a lot of it yourself, I'd invest in one of those. Um, Instagram is, is more of a uh, visual. Um, witness the dogs of Bear Pond. <laughs> um, you when you're using these platforms, you tag people and use hashtags. So you all know what hashtags hashtags are a universal internet language, basically. So if I put hashtag bear pond books, like everything, I'll find everything that's um, on Google search or something. I'll find everything in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all over the internet that's, that's um, recently been, in, it'll be ranked in, in um, re whether it's in the most recent order, so to the, to the most, to the latest. Um, it's important to respond, um, and I think, like, my first point here on, um, besides the regularity, engagement, authenticity, and collaboration, um, you know, I think Regularity is more important than volume, you know, amount of time. So, don't be afraid to, to you know, just if if you choose something, choose regularity over like two hours a day. You don't need to do it two hours a day. Um, you may need in the beginning to do some time um, up, getting up to speed. Um, Facebook, you have your personal profile pages. Um, Lots of different ways to use those, and and again, cross-posting, making connections, friend everyone you can, <clears throat> or connect with everyone you can. There are different ways to sort out your contacts into lists and people that you may not want to, you know, know what your kids look like. You know, there's there's ways to kind of separate yourself from that. So, um, LinkedIn. Do y'all know what LinkedIn is? Yeah, more business to business, but it can be valuable. Um, I publish there probably once a month. You know, when I have a video, or I'll publish that about because I I do a lot of uh, publishing on or um, social media on about about the publishing process as as a member of past president of Ethne and a member. Um, so that's re relevant to businesses. Uh, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube I've gotten, I've been doing YouTube videos for about six years, um, shows that, that recorded shows, and um, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a bridge too far for some people because it's, there's a lot of kind of technology and elements like audio, video, you know, the community media station would understand this. But it can be very powerful, and you can do it. Easy. You can actually do it easily. You can do it for free, and it can be a very powerful way to get your message out about your books. So um, I haven't touched like about ten percent of <laughs> what I meant to, but I'm happy to talk to anyone separately too. So thanks. Can for I just this. emphasize that yeah. point you made is that everything you're talking about is free. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's important if you're feeling hesitant, if you're not familiar with all these things. Yeah. That 
is the best. <coughs> and you, if you free have more time than money, use valuable. the free. <laughs> yeah, if, you, you can buy the pro versions, and they will do more for you. But um, you don't have to spend a lot. Yeah. Catherine. So just as a segue from that, just my own experience is that it's helpful if you're not a whiz with social media, it's helpful to start with the thing that you feel most drawn to. Um, because if you force yourself too much, like I've got to learn Twitter, and it's not enjoyable at all for you, mm -hmm. it just makes it so harder, and it's it's an uphill battle. So, I mean, looking at all the different ones that Charlotte was just describing, I would mm -hmm. say if there's one that you feel like, oh, I, could, I think I'd maybe like to do that, or I think I could handle that, for me it was Facebook. I have never been able to really figure out Twitter, I <laughs> confess. Um, I could figure it out, but I just, um, yeah. it, it didn't work as well for me. It wasn't, I wasn't as comfortable with that sort of communication mm -hmm. structure, I guess, or platform, I found Facebook to be more useful for me. Um, I knew more people on Facebook, too. I think one of the things is that you're trying to find your readers, you're trying to connect with your readers, and probably your first readers are going to be your friends. Um, so mm -hmm. if you have a lot of friends that are on Facebook, that might be where you want to go. If a lot of your friends are on Twitter, you know, that might be the place that you want to go first. So, but that's just sort of tagging along my yeah, own experience with that. Yeah. Um, I thought that I, well, just, I publish a, a suspense thriller series. That's my background. I started, my first book was, got published, I independently published it in 2013. I started with an assisted publishing service and then I just went completely independent. So an assisted publishing service is one that basically you, you get, pay them a fee and they take care of it all for you. And that was very appealing to me when I was starting out. Um, and then as I got more <coughs> knowledge on how this whole process works, I gained more confidence in knowing that, you know, a lot of this is not that hard and I think I could probably do a lot of it myself. Um, so, I started doing everything independently, but I do not, I, I don't, um, wouldn't detract at all from for somebody who wanted to do an assisted publishing. My advice would be if you're looking, if you're weighing how you want to do it, if you've decided that you want to independently publish, um, is just to really vet the, the group that you're looking at in terms of who you might be giving your money to. Um, and make sure that they are reputable, make sure that they're not taking more than they should. Um, it, you know, check with others maybe to, to just make sure that you're really getting something of value and something that's not kind of a scam, because um, there are scammy ones out there. Um, there are also really good ones out there. I think that if you're doing it for the first time, you might find that that's the way to go. Um, you might have enough confidence right at the beginning to just say, I think I can do this myself. Um, and you can. I mean, there are a lot of moving parts to independent publishing, but they are conquerable um, if you sort of break them down into the pieces of what, what you need to do in terms of um, you know, you need you need editing assistance. You need design assistance. You need you know, formatting, figuring out your distribution. All of that. <clears throat> it's a big job, but you know, if you sort of take it in pieces and learn it slowly, it's it's doable. I did it. Um, so if I can do it, <laughs> let me tell you, anybody can do it. <laughs> um, in terms of the marketing piece, that's going to be the 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 part that will be the hardest. Everything else, the act of actually getting a book made and onto a shelf or, um, you know, in a bookstore, online, um, that's not going to be the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge then is going to be the visibility and how you can, how you can get readers. Um, from my experience, I thought I might talk a little bit about the ebook strategy um, because that is you definitely should have an ebook if you go ahead and decide that you're going to um, publish your own book. Um, I think it's uh, some people will only do ebooks now. I I think it's good to have a print book. Um, I like to have print books. I like to have them. You know, it's a thing that you can give somebody and show I did something. Um, but ebooks are definitely 
they need to be in your toolkit because once you've had them formatted, or if you get to that point, you've formatted it yourself, there's no production cost. Um, and the distribution is pennies to distribute. Um, so it's definitely something to have in the toolkit because, you know, there's, it's, it's going to bring a return on your investment pretty quickly. Um, it's also, there's, there's more infrastructure in place to market ebooks um, in terms of online opportunities. And I can tell you a little bit about how that has developed over the years. The, the earlier days, up until about 2012, when self-publishers were kind of starting to get rolling in between 2008, 2009 through 2012, um, and they were kind of feeling around for what to do, there weren't a lot of, there weren't a lot of resources at that point. So for the most part, and there also wasn't a lot of content. So people would just, you know, put things out and put things online and they would sell because of the price. So the price point was the key. Early on, people were selling their eBooks for a lot less money and that was all they needed to do to get, to get their books sold. Um, then as you know, competition started getting a little bit more intense, you needed to have some other strategies. And that's where some, some of the strategies came in for you know, juggling the pricing of your book, um, maybe looking at how the books are being described at your various retail sites, um, you know, making sure that you're kind of grabbing the algorithms of the online retailers that are selling the book. Um, and there are different strategies for that. As time went on, there started to be promotional sites available to, to help um, market the ebooks through, um, you know, you, you could run, it's basically a one day promotion, and these promotional sites would have um, big mailing lists that they would s send your book out to, and it would either be maybe 99 cents for the day or free for the day. Um, and that started to be, you know, the thing to do. That was sort of the, the fad for a long time, um, was to use the promo sites. BookBub ended up being the biggest one. I don't know, mm -hmm. have, have any of you heard of the BookBub site? Mm -hmm. um, that ended up being the best uh, return for um, authors because it was a more selective process. There were fewer slots available. It was more expensive um, to promote, and you it was harder to get a slot. When you did get a slot, they have a an enormous subscriber list at this point. So the return on the the investment it would cost you know, three three hundred dollars I think is what they started at. It's over four hundred dollars now for for a one day promotion, but you would make at least double that. Um, for the promotion. So that started to be a pretty intense um, strategy that authors use for a while. In today's landscape, BookBub is still, is still very much um, out there and, and people still get slots. If you have a wide distribution, if you have lots of different retail points, um, it seems to be a better uh, option because I think they they are more likely to accept uh, a book that is widely distributed instead of just being <coughs> on Amazon or just on Kobo. These are different sort of online retailers: Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Apple, Google Play, Amazon. Um, so if you're widely distributed on all those platforms, you you're you're better um, apt to get a BookBub slot. Um, the other promo sites, not as much, but um, that's kind of how that works. Um, the new thing, though, is the social media advertising that is becoming a far more active part of a lot of authors' stra marketing strategies now, and it is it sort of reflects the gradual professionalization of um, independent publishers because it is them becoming really more savvy marketers and advertisers. So they're actually, they are advertising on Facebook and they are advertising using Amazon's um, marketing services. So you can actually design little graphical, um, you know, just little graphical ads as sponsored product ads or if you're, if you're going through Facebook, you'll come across these 
sponsored posts and those are ads basically that's that whoever it is if it's like mcdonald's or sears or whoever it is that you're seeing that's an ad that that group has paid for and every once in a while you might see a book you might see an author pop up in your news feed and it'll be you know a little blurb for a book um, that you can buy at whatever retailer they're pulling out um, that's a that's what a lot of people are seeing is a long-term strategy for for marketing their books for their ebooks I should stress um, because they're it's more sustainable it's using a lot of different um, you know audience targeting functions segmenting um, analytical tools that are provided by Facebook and Amazon different lists of keywords that you can you know target to send <clears throat> to specific audiences that you think might be interested in your book um, it's very complicated. I have not mastered it myself yet. It, it requires a lot. There's a steep learning curve for it. People who have that sort of aptitude that like sort of the analytics and the graphs and, and that kind of thing uh, do really well with it. Um, it requires some basic graphic design skills because you have to put up your own little ad on Facebook and, and Amazon. Um, but so, so that those are some of the things that that are kind of on the landscape right now. Um, the old fashioned strategies I think are still relevant. I still have a lot of success with the promotional sites. There are lots of different ones. Um, free Kindle books and tips and e-reader news today are two that were two of the first ones that came out. Um, but there's also kind of, there's one called the Fussy Librarian. Uh, free booksy there's just a whole bunch of different promotional sites and you basically you you grab a slot for a certain amount of money you um, have a discounted price on your book or maybe you're offering it for free for one day um, and they're sending it out to their mailing list and you're watching downloads happen and the idea is that hopefully on the day after you've had your promotion people are gonna people are gonna be still hitting that ad and even though it's not free anymore, they're going to start buying it. Um, when you when they start buying it, your rank at, at the retail site that you're at goes up a little bit. It becomes more visible, and more people buy it, and you get sort of a little bit of a knock-on effect there. Could you mention those companies again? Those sure. Companies? Um, free Booksy. What is it? Free Booksy. Free Booksy. Yeah, I think it's just freebooksy.com. Uh, the Fussy Librarian. Um, Kindle, free Kindle books and tips. Uh, E-reader news today. Those are just a few. There's a ton of them, actually. There's a bunch more. Insta freebie. Insta freebie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's so that's kind of I I still do find that useful. There are some people who are saying you know that's it's that it's the Facebook advertising and the and the other sorts of uh, more analytical advertising that is the wave of the future. Um, since I have not been able to master that yet, I'm still I'm still focused on the promo sites and I'm doing all right with those. So um, so I still think that those are good pump primers. To sort of get some sales happening and maybe also to get some reviews happening which is always a challenge once you've got a book out there is to try and get people to post some reviews for you because that also helps to make the more you know the more you have on the site the more you have on your product page um, the more the algorithm is kind of finding it and picking it and showing it to people um, so so all of the, so I do think the promo sites can be helpful. Um, I think that it's good to not to try to do everything at once. Once you get the first one done, is you, you know I wouldn't say dive into Facebook advertising and the promo sites and you know the the big Twitter. I, I think you might again sort of think about what is going to work best for you and how you know where your strengths lie. Um, and, and, and have that help to guide you into what you think is going to be the best place to start anyway with the marketing. Um, and I will say that marketing also works better once you have one book published. So it, it gets easier when you have another book published and then another book published. Um, the more shelf space you have, the more visible you become. Um, so the best marketing strategy is to keep writing. <laughs> <laughs> and 
with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and say really a lot in five minutes. Um, so I will just jump in. My name is Bill Schubart. Um, I've published seven books. Um, across the spectrum of publishing, my first book was with a hybrid or assist publisher who approached me about doing a book. It was called The Memorial Stories. Um, I self-published the next six books, and my last book um, was published on a Simon & Schuster imprint um, as a hardcover. And I've just finished another book, which has gone to the editor. Um, I want to say a quick word about how radically publishing has changed. When I was young, there was no spectrum. There was vanity publishing and there was traditional publishing. It was like nurses and doctors. There was nothing in between. And now it's completely filled out. And uh, Charlotte, I think you said earlier, um, or it may have been you, um, in the middle, you have to be really careful. You need to get a really, you need to say, I want to know, I want to the emails of three or four authors that you've published and verify that. Mm -hmm. I, I will also say to you that publishing is in utter chaos. Um, I used to run a company that managed distribution for broadcasters and publishers. And I remember talking to the then president of HarperCollins at her request about how she could market online. And it was a long discussion that I, I won't bore you with, but I basically said HarperCollins is not a brand. It's a financial brand. Nobody walks into Bear Pond Books and says, <laughs> what's new from HarperCollins? <laughs> and <clears throat> that got the whole conversation off badly. <laughs> the second thing where I drove myself right into the ground with Jane was, um, I said, you made a terrible mistake. Because when ebooks came along, you imputed no value to content. So readers always assume that the value was resident in the medium, not the content. Readers thought a hardcover book is worth $25, a paperback book is worth $15, an ebook there should be free or 99 cents. And because you never came out to the public and said content is worth $8. If you want that content as an ebook, it'll be $9.95. If you want it as a paperback, it'll be $14.90 and so on, whatever. And um, I think the publishers are still absolutely scrambling to figure out what the hell is going on, how they can, uh, how they can put up a defense against Amazon. They never understood that their, their brands were their authors, not themselves. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I had to say that. Um, but content is king, and content has value. Um, everyone in this room is either a would-be writer or a writer, and you think you're writers. If you're going to be serious about your work, you might start thinking right now that you're going to have three job descriptions. You are going to be an author, you're going to be a publisher, even if with you, you are with a traditional publisher, mm -hmm. and you are going to be a marketer. And if you don't tick through all three of those things every day, success is going to be very elusive. Because you have three job descriptions. And I got to tell you, it's a bitch managing those three. I don't want to be a marketer. I don't want to be a publisher. I just want to be an author. <laughs> but I learned very early on that I need to be all three. Um, the, the most important thing that I would say to you is, and I, I, I say this to writers as well as people who are trying to sell their books, the most important thing is to get out of your head. It matters less what you write than what is read. Just as in a conversation, it matters less what you say than what is heard. So, and I'll come back to that in a second, how that impacts my own process. Um, but the same is true in marketing. You know, if you get you know, 2,500 offset books from your hybrid publisher or your, your independent publishing, your self-publishing, 
um, and you go marching into a bookstore and say, hey, I've got a new book, it's absolutely unbelievable, it's going to be a bestseller, I need you to take 50 copies, you know, you can just put 10 in the window, and maybe I can get an end cap, and um, can you pay me cash? <laughs> you have so destroyed any relationship with anybody who can help you. And, and the reason I, I suggest that sort of allegory about writing is it's true in marketing, too. If you want to be in a bookstore, you need to understand what a bookstore owner has to go through. You really need to know that before you walk in the store and say, I have a new book, can you help me? It's a very different approach. That is true of libraries. That is true of book clubs. <coughs> that is true of book festivals. You need to get out of your own head and into their head. What are they looking for that you might be able to help them with? So if you get stuck in the artistic ego, you're going to struggle. It's going to be really hard. Um, the, um, I'm going to say a little bit, I want to go back to something I said about being a writer. Um, when I write a first draft of a novel or a collection of short stories, I have no idea if it's any good. I have no idea. And that sort of odd humility defines my process. The first thing I do is find three people to be a critical reader. And they're not my best friends, they're not my kids, they're not my family. There are people who don't owe me anything, who, who I will get a clear answer from. The second thing is, and this is never popular when I say it, is I pay them. Um, as an author, the number of people who come up to me and say, oh, I have a small favor to ask of you. Would you read my new 300-page manuscript? And maybe write you know, uh, four or five pages about what you think about it, and you know, we could maybe talk. You know, I, I'd buy you lunch. <laughs> You've just asked for a week of my time. I'm 72. I just keep track of my time. But, um, so I pay critical readers. Mm -hmm. And I pay attention to what they have to say. And we meet for an hour or two hours. And some of the feedback I get is hard copy. My new book is about a Catholic priest. And I used a Catholic priest as a critical reader. And I got a tremendous amount of stuff, like you said apps, you meant nave. You said vestry, you meant sacristy. Mm -hmm. You said alb, you meant chasuble. And those things seem small, but they're mm -hmm. really important because they become distractions. Um, in, in marketing, um, I have developed over the year the tools that I need, and those tools are databases. I have uh, a database of every functioning bookstore in Vermont. I have their website, their Facebook page, their contact information, the name of the book buyer. In the case of a large bookstore, there may be three people. In the case of a smaller bookstore, it may be one contact person. And in that Excel database, it says they only do mystery, or they only do used books, or they're a college bookstore, or they're terrifically good at literary fiction, which not everybody is. Um, so I have, I, I maintain that. I've developed it over the years. It's got 70 entries. I do the same with what I call reader-friendly libraries. There's 251, I think, libraries in Vermont. And probably about 40 of those love having authors come in. Mm -hmm. So I have that same database for them. The email contact for the events person, phone number, Facebook page. And when I have a new book come out, I send out a what looks like a personalized email, but it's, it's a general email to those people saying, I'd love to come talk to your your patrons, and I don't say I want to come market my book, because <laughs> libraries don't sell books. 
I take something that I believe is relevant from my book. My latest book, um, Lila and Theron, is really about how rural culture has changed in the last hundred years. So I structure a conversation not about my book. I structure a conversation about and it, one that engages people. How has rural culture changed? And then, of course, during the course of that, it's the 80-20 rule that you mentioned, Charlotte, um, people develop an interest in the book. And I might allude to the book during that. But the conversation is an engagement between me and the people who come to that event. It's not me trying to sell them a book. Um, I have recently begun teaching a course at the Elder College. And again, it will be a course built around a book that I've written. Um, I've taught one at, in Middlebury at the Elder College, and it's sold out the first time, and I've just taught another one based on Lila and Theron. It wasn't about Lila and Theron, but everyone who came to that course had to read the book, and they, of course, had to buy it. Um, and again, the discussion was, in your lifetime, how has rural culture changed? as it relates to the culture in the classroom when you were a child, the retail culture in your community, how people view death, how religion and churches have changed. Completely engaging. Not me selling my book, but me having a discussion with people about something that they cared about that just happened to relate to my book. Um, the um, I want to say a word about quality. Um, every once in a while, somebody sends me a book, and I look at it, and I am completely, I've totally lost interest because I've looked at it. I haven't even read the first paragraph. If you are anywhere in the spectrum between self-publishing, assist, or hybrid publishing, or traditional publishing, if your book doesn't look like it was published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, <laughs> Don't waste anybody's time. I get books that look like they were made on mimeograph machines. And what it immediately says to me is the same thing it used to say to me when I owned a record company and people would send me a demo. And I'd put the cassette in and I'd listen and the guitar would be out of tune. I never listened to the song. If the person doesn't care enough to tune the guitar, I don't want to hear what they have to say. I'm sorry. And the same is true of the book. And that means you put a lot of attention into the preparation of a book, or you will be unable to market it. Mm -hmm. And that includes the indicia page, the quality of the graphics, the quality of the type style, um, you know, the Library of Congress information, the books in print information. So if you care about what you've written, make sure it looks like it was published by Farrar Strauss or Knopf or you know, some. And it's not hard to do. But that's a key piece of the marketing. Um, m m if you go to a publisher or an agent today, the first thing they're going to ask you is not, oh, what have you written? They're going to say, what's your platform? And that is important. And you, know, you both alluded to it. Um, my platform, which is different, is I'm a commentator for Vermont Public Radio. And I've got 1,600 people who have opted in, opted in to get my commentaries on VPR. And so what I do is I send out those commentaries to those people. Um, and then occasionally, when I have a new book coming out, I say, thank you for you know, subscribing to my, my commentaries on VPR. You might be interested to know I have a new book. Here's what it's about. Here's what some people have said about it. Um, and that's it. And I do that maybe anywhere from once to three times a year. Um, and that's it. Because I don't want to abuse the platform, but I want to use it. So again, to your issue with Charlotte of the 80-20 rule, if I was promoting a book, every time I sent that out, I would start to get unsubscribes. Mm -hmm. So um, use that carefully and wisely. Um, answer emails. If I, write a, if I write an edgy commentary, I may get 100 emails <laughs> running from 
you have no idea what you're talking about. I wish you were dead. <laughs> to, um, boy, this was, I'm really glad you said this. Most of them are supportive. I mean, Vermont is not, I, I don't get hateful commentaries. I get commentaries that are fair and disagree. Mm. I had one in Digger this morning, and a, a woman wrote a really beautiful commentary, and I responded publicly to her commentary. And I said, you're absolutely right. And maybe I did not make this point strongly enough. It was about depression and medicating depression. Um, so, but, but my rule is, no matter how many emails I get, I answer all of them. It may be just thank you very much for being in touch. I appreciate your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've spoken long enough. Um, but again, the most important thing I would say to you is get out of your head. If you really want help from other people, get into their head. Mm -hmm. Because then you will understand. And they will appreciate the fact that you've made the effort to understand how incredibly complicated the independent book business is. People are in the independent book business not to get rich. They're in it because they believe in community. They believe in authors and writing and quality. Um, and if they make money, they're grateful. And if you understand that, and you approach them on that basis, you'll get much further. Thank you. I wish I'd gone first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, clearly you are a talent of engaging people. I'll, OK, I'll give you a shot. You're going to be great. I know, thanks. I know. Thanks. So, thank you for saying all that. I mean, there's so much about that that I resonate with. And what everybody said, so I'll go back there a bit. And you guys have probably read my bio, so you know I've designed for more years than I feel like talking about. But I, I too, come from a publishing background and um, books and continuity and books when we cut books. When we were, there were no Macintoshes, there were no, we were putting books together. It was beautiful, it was a beautiful thing. And, and when that went away, the industry already began to change. And it has changed so much. And for me, some of the sadness in that has been to see some people say, yeah, I wrote this book, and now I'm going to this publisher, and they're taking on the design, and they're going to run off with this thing, they're going to make this thing happen. And that really breaks my heart, because whatever you've worked on, whether you have already or you're starting, is something you've put all of your heart into. It's your expression. It's your art. So if you look at the wall behind you, there's a whole wall of beautiful books and beautiful book covers. And hopefully, 98% of those people love the cover that's sitting on that bookshelf. That's what you want. So for me, in my relationship with a writer, I want them to know that they are part of the design. The design is there. So you made four points. You said you have to take, you, you, you need to understand that you are not only the author, but you're also the publisher and the marketer. You're also the designer. So in my work, I do what is called collaborative design alchemy. And what that means is I may be designing, but it's never without you. So it's what we do together. And the alchemy part of it is that in the end, we want the golden nugget, the philosopher's stone. But the whole path through has its ups and downs. I never go straight to design, no matter what you said. We'll have conversations, many conversations. And I highly recommend a couple of things. One is, when you choose your designer, look at their work, but also like them. You have to love who's on your team. And that's a big story. When you talked before about, you know, um, do your homework. Who are you working with? What's the attitude of the person that you're dealing with? When you're on the phone with that person, do you feel that they have as much care and devotion to your creation that they should? And maybe beyond? This is a long relationship. You want to feel at home with the people you're working with. It's really important. There were a few things said here that I love. So Charlotte said, be your truth. Be your truth. We talked about blogging. Be your truth in your book, 
the way it looks, the way you market it, it's you. So don't take somebody's formula and get lost in the formula. This is you, this is your work, this is your art. Passion, it is your passion. So when you blog or whatever you do, it's important that you show up truly authentically because if you don't, that will be seen over time as well. Um, Catherine said, um, recognize what you are most drawn to. That's all about chemistry. So all of this in your project, in the labors that you've done in creating what you have come to now, needs to continue on into the world in a beautiful way. It should roll out in as if you are still writing it. So it may seem really overwhelming. I don't get the marketing. I don't like Facebook. I don't like, you don't have to like them all. You have to focus in on one or two, whether you like it or not. And after you get over it, you probably will like it OK, because it serves you quite well. For instance, if you do a website in Squarespace to support your book, which is not expensive, it too, every blog you make there can be posted on Facebook and Twitter and everything else. So with one click of one button, you're out in the world. But to back up from that, when I work with a client, I want to read the book. I want to talk to the client many, many times. I want to know why you wrote the book. What's your passion? Why do you want that out in the world? If you're doing a book on canning, because you're so passionate about canning, but your real deal is you don't just want it here. You want people in cities all over the United States to start canning in small quantities, in tiny apartments. I want to know that, because the cover needs to reflect that same passion. All the covers on the wall here, you know, you look back on them, and you may look at a few and go like, whoa, that doesn't work for me at all, and oh, I, I kind of like that one. And that's what we want to get to. So whoever, I guess, if I'm going to back up here, in the design process, whoever you work with, not only do you want to like what they've done in the past, you want to like their attitude. You want to know that they love what you're doing just about as much as you do. That their real goal is to launch that baby onto that shelf or on some page in a JPEG format that really makes your heart sing, makes you super happy. If you don't do that, it's kind of like you made all this effort and then just said, eh, oh well. And it's going to hurt. Like having a bad paint job on your house. Every time you see it, you're going to, oh, I did all that. And oh, <laughs> right? Um, so I think the, the common theme in all of this is you've made a beautiful project. You need a team that you trust and love to help you get it out there. And in the end, when it is out there, you're going to want to do another, because it was such a beautiful relationship. Uh, I don't think I've really Whoa. forgotten anything. I, well, <laughs> that's kind of what I have to say. I just want to add one short thing to that, because yeah, I think it's so important. Um, <clears throat> my, my approach to a designer has always been, I'm a writer, you're a designer. I need you, to, and I'm just supporting everything you're saying, I need you to read my book and make a beautiful cover. And it was interesting because in my last book, I was told, well, when you go with this imprint of Simon & Schuster, you're going to lose all control. And they hired a book designer who had done 2,600 books, lived in Paris, and he read the book and he sent me a note very uncharacteristically, and he said, I love the book. Do you have any thoughts? He said, I've worked out the format, the topography, everything else. And I said, I love this photograph. And it was a Richard Brown photograph. And some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with those. He's been on three of my covers. <clears throat> and his new book, by the way, is gorgeous, The Law of Last of the Hill Farms. Mm -hmm. And I sent him the photograph, and he said, it's breathtaking. It works perfectly, and he used it. Mm -hmm. I was stunned, because mm -hmm. I thought it would be a typical sort of Amazon topography solution. Mm -hmm. So that whole issue of understanding and collaboration, I could not agree with you more. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I'm going to talk about some of the practical matters of getting your book in local bookstores. Um, and you want, a lot of you I know are, live in Montpelier and you're probably going to think of Bear Pond first, <laughs> I hope. Um, but you don't want to stop there. The, getting it just in your the t store in your town is not enough. Uh, you want to go further than that. So and um, right, so anyway, I'll have some tips for how to get that done. Um, the first thing that the bookstore needs to know is we need to know about your book. We need to know it exists. We don't we don't know this. We don't get this information from other places necessarily, unless you're with a major publishing house. So let us know ahead of time, preferably if you can. Um, it, come into the store. If you don't know who to talk to, if you don't already know who the person is, the buyer is in the store, um, you can um, bring in a copy of copy of the book and drop it off with us if you have one. Bring a sell sheet, which would can be just a one-page sheet, just tells us basic information. Who you are, what your local connection is, what maybe what the local connection of the book is. If it's set in Vermont, it's about Vermont. If, and it doesn't need to be, but that is an added kind of bonus for a, for a local store. Um, what your local connection is, um, how we can get in touch with you, how we can order the book. Uh, that's a very important factor for us. How are we going to get the book if we carry the book? Are we going to get it directly from you? That's okay, but we need to know. Um, are you gonna? Is it going to be available from our wholesale distributors that we work with regularly, or directly from the publisher? All those things we need to know. We need to know how much it's going to cost. Um, we uh, so come on in with your book and your thing. Please do not give a sales pitch to the person behind the counter. <laughs> that person may not be likely is not the person making the decision. Sorry, um, is there more than one person named Bill here? Okay, there, if you, is your card back here? Yes. It's in a tow zone. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you just lost all your credibility. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought that my opinion was. Nice. They asked for you by name. <laughs> I wonder how that happened. Maybe it's uh, his license plate or something. Right, right. Um, so I don't, do not want to skip over that point about please do not um, give your sales pitch to the person behind the counter. Please do not tell them what your book is about and the full plot and how meaningful it is to you. Those are great things to talk about at a later date, but the person behind the counter is not necessarily going to be making that decision nor has time for a cold call. And that's what it is, and nobody likes a cold call. So that, that's just a matter of politeness, and um, it's something a lot of people don't no. Um, so um, quite often we'll uh, offer to carry a local book um, that doesn't maybe have a track record or an author who doesn't have a track record on consignment. We do that. That's pretty standard operating procedure. That is um, not an insult, which most people know, but we've had a we had a <laughs> recent <laughs> brush so up on outrageous. Facebook. I mentioned it because maybe people saw it, where um, <laughs> someone really felt, a local author really felt that that was uh, offensive, that we offered to take their book on consignment. It, it's not. <laughs> it's really not. It's just how, how things work. Um, if, if a book doesn't have a track record or it's somebody we don't know, we, we just, that's just not how it's done. Um, um, and I mentioned, yes, tell us where we can get it. So books that we're most likely to take are um, books that do have some kind of local angle, whether the subject matter or the author. Most of you are local already, so that helps. Um, sometimes, though, a local author will write a book about their mother's story growing up on a farm in Kansas. That's going to be a hard sell for us. Um, so you just you know you have to think about things like that. Uh, we, we can't oh, we can't sell, it, it doesn't mean we won't take a book if it's a local author, but it, it, that is going to color uh, whether it, we, we think it's going to sell or not. Um, we are more apt to take books that we can get conveniently. If it's available from our Ingram, for example, as a, a wholesale distributor, or um, that is really easy for us. If you live in town and you're willing to bring them down, that's really easy for us. Um, but with some published, some uh, independent publishers, uh, even if we can get them on Ingram, there might be a short, what we call a short discount, 
uh, which is a very small discount for us, that does not benefit us, or they're non-returnable. Those are books that we're not going to take a chance on. We don't carry books at a short discount. We rarely care. We like to not carry books that are non-returnable. Um, so if that's your deal, if you if you have a deal uh, with Ingram, those are factors for us. Um, consider who you are publishing with. Uh, you know, Amazon has a lot of op op options. Um, we don't carry books that are published by Amazon. A lot of people are surprised to hear that after they've published with Amazon and bring them back to us. Um, Amazon is, well, we have a lot of feelings about Amazon. We don't work with Amazon. <laughs> I can tell you all my feelings about it another time. I'm sure you can imagine. But we, don't, we do not carry books that are published on Amazon. So consider that when you're making a decision. Maybe that's OK with you. Maybe you really want your book on Amazon. And that's the way that, that that works for you. Can I just clarify? Do you you mean published by Amazon? Published by Amazon. Create Pub space books that yeah. are available yes. on Amazon. But so not, create space. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So not yes. The Phoenix is the same. Uh, mo well, most independent bookstores that I know of yeah. have, have a similar. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of what I'm saying is a lot of the other independent bookstores in the area um, have the same policies. So, um, and you know, we wrote this do and don't list with Galaxy, you know, we all, we all kind of have the same, feel the same way. Um, yes? Just one tiny little thing, because people might worry about, I want to be on Amazon. If you have an ISBN, you're pretty much going to get on Amazon. I think that's what yeah. clarifying. It's not what being on Amazon. It's not that no, your book no, is no, sold by Amazon. I know, I can say, I'm kind of buying time. I, I, I tell people they're published, and they're always saying, you're going to get an answer to that anyway. Yes. Um, so you, you kind of have to balance what, what your goals are. If um, Amazon is not going to put it on the shelf in your, local, in your community. So if that's what's important to you, consider that. Um, consider your costs um, when you're, if, when you're self-publishing. Sometimes people, it, it's very expensive. And if you come in with a, a paperback that's $30, that you have to get $30 for to cover your costs, and then we need to get our cut of our 40%, and then you're like, oh, then I'm not going to make any money at all. But it's already a $30 paperback. It's gonna, that's going to be a hard sell. We can't, we're probably not going to be able to sell it. We can, might carry it for you, but it's probably not going to sell. Um, if that's something that you're concerned about in the process, in the production process, we'd be happy to talk to you about it then and give you our advice on whether it would sell or not. Um, we have been doing this for a long time, so we do. We are pretty familiar with what will sell and what won't. Doesn't mean we're right all the time, and doesn't mean that things can't take off. But we d we do know our customers and um, we know the market pretty well. Um, and we do love a, uh, an author who comes in with a good marketing plan. Um, you know, somebody who knows what they're doing is very appealing. <laughs> um, tag you know, them on Instagram. Tag them on Instagram. Contact local media outlets. Small, contact the Bridge and the Times Argus with press releases. Those small local papers are willing to do articles or reviews um, about a local author. Um, you know, contact, as other people said, contact libraries. Uh, Put out to on your Facebook page that you're willing to come talk to book groups. Give them the idea. Choose my book, and I'll come and be a guest speaker at your book group. People love that. We do it here in the store. We do it, you know, with local book groups. It's, it really adds something to a book group to have an author come. Um, so they might be willing to read your book when maybe they weren't thinking of that already. Um, let's see. Uh, we have uh, some authors who will tell their um, well, first of all, they'll, they'll tell people where, it's a, where the book is available, that it is available locally, and we very much appreciate that. So you tell your friends that. Put that on your social media that you can get it at Bear Pond. Put it on your website. You could link to us on your website. Um, you can also, uh, we, ha we have some authors who will put out on their website, order it from Bear Pond Books, and I will come down and inscribe it for their out-of-town <laughs> friends. I will come down and inscribe it, and Bear Pond will mail it to you. And we call them up and say, hey, got some orders. Come on down. You know, it takes a few days. It's not a real super quick process. But uh, people love that. So that you, know, you, you reach your out-of-town fans who um, when have an opportunity to get something personalized like that. 
So those are some of the ideas. Um, then quickly on events, because everybody wants to have an event too, because that's a great way to get um, the word out about your book is to have an event at your local bookstore. Um, <laughs> we um, get far more event requests than we can ever do in a week or a month or a year. Um, so we are not going to be able to say yes just because you are local. Um, we, we, love, we do a lot of local events. Uh, do you ever combine them, like have a couple of authors at this same Yes, time? we do. <clears throat> yes, and we're working on some things mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, right now. Um, yeah, so um, we will definitely consider it, but we can't always say yes, unfortunately. It's just, it's, it's a labor intensive <clears throat> for us, resource intensive for us to throw an event. Um, you know, sometimes we have people say, well, I see that you don't have anything next Tuesday. Can I come? It's just not that <laughs> easy. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we have a lot we put into our events and, you know, we, we do a lot of work for them and it's, we just can't, we can't say yes to everybody, unfortunately. Um, so we would like to know about books ahead of time if we are going to consider events. Sometimes it's like we plan events three to six months ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're booked right now through, I think, the end of May right now. Through June. Through June. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let's see if there's anything else. Um, yeah, and just that we have a good feel for how our events go. So we just ask people to, when we make a decision about that, to respect that decision. We don't want to, if we don't want to throw a bad event, and if we really feel like we're not going to get a turnout for a book, and we decide not to do an event, um, that's actually in your best interest because you don't want to do an event that nobody comes to either. So we do know our audience, and we do know who we're marketing to. So just and the author should be a full participant in the promotion of the event, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We would need the author to, you know, email their contact list, put it on their Facebook page, the whole bit, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's everything that I have, um, but definitely willing to take questions. Are we? Now's a good time to move to the question. <laughs> First question. Has anybody worked with audiobooks? from self-publishing? Mm -hmm. What was your experience like? Um, it, it's difficult because there aren't, it's harder to market because you don't have any control over the pricing of the audiobook. Oh, that's the yeah, Audible and ACX, the, there are different platforms that you can use if you're using the ACX platform and, and going to Audible and iTunes mm -hmm. and Google, I think is the th third one. Mm -hmm. um, then, then, then you're exceeding to what they want to price the book at. If you do it more independently, then you're taking on more of the responsibility for you know getting the distribution out there to, to various places. And, but then you do have a little bit more control over. Do you get your own narrator? Uh, yes, there. the The platform is uh, is one that that kind of connects you with narrators. So you upload an audition script. You mm -hmm. put up your book title and a little bit unless of a description. You want to do your own. Um, if you want, you can audio. I, unless you're a really, really good narrator, really? I don't recommend that. Uh -huh. A lot of people probably think, oh, I can just read my own book. But mm -hmm. if you're not really good at it, yeah. then it's not. Oh, you should, yeah, yeah. yeah. I I, that. It's like I, and uh, there are some people who are very good at it, and mm -hmm. I've and I've certainly listened to audiobooks by people who mm -hmm. have read their own, yeah. and and sometimes it works. I yeah. think you have to. You know, let somebody tell you maybe yeah. if you should be doing it or not. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Claire, I have but, a question about um, about um, the discount. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. Were you? No, I, if that um, answered your question. So in Ingram, they give you a yeah, choice: yeah. forty percent or fifty percent, fifty-five percent discount. I mean, off the cover price. They give who the a wholesale choice? wholesale discount. So I can choose. I can choose twenty, forty. <coughs> so that when you order a wholesale, when a bookstore orders it, mm -hmm. do you get, I mean, are you buying that book at 55% off? Or no. no, it's you're, a Hobson's you're, choice, <laughs> you, believe me. You, like, what do they give you as far, I mean, what do they take off of that 50 For Ingram, it's usually more around 40%. Okay, so you, they're going to keep 10%, 15%, yeah. They're going to get their cut. Yeah. Everybody's going to get their cut. <laughs> so it's best. Ingram better needs for, a cut. The bookstore needs a cut. Everybody needs a cut. But it's better for us 
is if to encourage bookstore sales to give the highest discount so that you you get I don't know that end yeah. of it. I don't uh -huh. know that I didn't know that you had that a choice. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, if you really want to be in bookstores, you just need to go you with need the highest conventional. Percent. Yeah, and and the other thing you need to sign up for is 100% returns. Yes, right. th that's true. Yeah. Yeah, and that may be. I don't know how, what they present mm -hmm. to you, but that may be why sometimes we get things and yeah. you'll only get twenty percent off on it. Right. So and it's non-returnable. That's not. That's a, not a risk that we yeah. want to take. Right. And we found that some, um, like well, somebody we know in Montpelier, we know we're going to sell some. So sure, we'll take some, even though it's mm -hmm. short discount and it's non-returnable. But we're willing to take a chance on it. It's somebody we know and they've got a network and yeah. that's fine. And then they go to other bookstores in Vermont, and the other bookstores are say, no, we don't know you. I'm yeah. not going to take a chance on this. So they've gone through all this, and they've gotten their book in one bookstore. Yeah. And that's, so, you know, yeah. watch out for that, because the uh, bookstore in Burlington is not going to take a chance, because, well, I don't care if you're from Montpelier. I don't know who you are, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have a standard consignment rate, or do you? We do. do you it's 60-40. You do 60-40. So, 60 for the because mm -hmm. major mm -hmm. publishers typically have a 55% discount and the distributor gets 15 and the bookstore gets the 40 that you get. So when you do consignment, you stay with your 40, which mm -hmm. is where you're comfortable for your own discount, et cetera. And I should clarify that I use Lightning Source, not Ingram Spark. Because Me I was too. grandfathered in as a Me too. when in, before Ingram mm -hmm. Spark was started. So. I get more options, I think. Yeah. So, what is the difference anyway between those two? One is for like small to medium sized, or for you know like when you've had a few books. I, I'm not sure exactly what the criteria is, but if you have one book, you're going to go with Ingram Spark. Ingram Spark really was designed to compete with Create Space. Yeah. With I'm sorry. Create Space. They wanted to get into. Uh -huh. the, they wanted to. They wanted to use all their on-demand printing that they had. Um, if you if you are a small self publisher, the ideal place to be is is Lightning. Mm -hmm. What do you guys Actually, think? Actually, it's not an option anymore. No. Lulu's horrible. I, I, know. I, I so. grandfathered into Lightning, so all my books are available there. So I'm treated essentially like a publisher. And you all have a book about Ingram Spark in your packet. Lulu, you should stay away from Lulu, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Crappy, crappy quality. It's not known as a good uh, is for distribution, and it's. From Lulu, what was the other yeah. one? Did you say? Don't use Lulu. Do not use Lulu. Did you, Did you say two? Google? No. Lulu. Lulu. Oh, Lulu. Lulu. I agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's crappy. Yeah. Question. Yeah. The nice thing about Ingram Spark also is that if you want to get on. You're automatically online mm -hmm. with a lot of download sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I actually uh, am a small publisher myself, and uh, I, I want to underscore everything that the folks here said because they're all really important things to consider as an author. Um, probably doing the cover right, uh, editing it. Not editing it yourself, but actually hiring an editor. To do or that. your grandmother, who was an English teacher. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all of those kinds of things are really important. One of the things that I've learned in this business is that what all of this is about is your story. Whatever the story is you're writing, uh, whether it's a book of poetry, whether it's a book about pain free joints, uh, no matter about goats, no matter what it's about. <laughs> It's a story, and it, your book is filled with all kinds of stories. Um, and when you, quote, sell your book, that 20% of the time when you're selling, don't sell it in the sense of, I'm selling you the book now. Uh, please buy my book. Tell the story. Mm -hmm. Tell one of the stories. Pick little parts of it little teasers. You know, the music, the, the music business, which I was in for a long time, the, the movie business, one of the things you may have noticed is that it, there used to be no trailers. Okay? There were previews in the theater. That's, that's how you found about, mm -hmm. out about a movie. Then there were trailers, trailer number one, or just trailer. 
Sometimes you see trailer number one, trailer number two, trailer number three. They're telling, telling little bits and pieces of that movie. They're not mm -hmm. selling it. They're just letting you see parts of that movie. And that's what you've got. You've got your own story. That's use a really that. good point. It, use that. I would, I would say don't be afraid to give stuff away. I mean, yes. it's, just, it's, people are not necessarily going to take it and, you know, crush you. I've got a book that's the Piragaji Handbook, and it's, it's public domain. We encourage people to take it. We give it away for free on, on uh, piragaji.org. It's about peer learning and peer production. And please, take it, copy it, please. You know, we, but we still sell it. Uh, we still sell the uh, print book for 20 bucks, and we financed our print run that way. So it's really, I mean, I think piracy is a real thing, but I don't think, you know, I think giving away chapters, things like that. Fictional Cafe, which I just started working with, there's a thing in here. Um, you can send us a chapter. And you know, it's we've got 500 subscribers. It's it's a great way to get, like you were saying, you know, just give people a sample, give them a taste. A variation yeah. on that is at Christmas time, if you have a blog platform, send out a short story gift. Mm -hmm. Just say Merry mm -hmm. Christmas. Mm -hmm. Here's a short story from my collection, or here's. Here's a, you know, a compelling chapter, whatever. But that nice. just supports it and make it look nice. So that, that's, no, that's absolutely right. Susan? Yeah. If um, you had, uh, you've written something yourself and you had a publisher interested, is there a reason, positive reasons you would self-publish rather than go with, with the publisher? Control. I didn't understand control, the question. Control issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, didn't I know understand. if you you mean if you had so, an so offer. Let's say you've written something and there's a publisher that you sent it to who's interested in publishing mm -hmm. it. A traditional publisher. Yeah, but but I mean, are there enough positive reasons to self-publish in terms of control that you might turn down the publisher and do it yourself? No. I think it depends yeah. on. The, <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what the I yeah. would say. Yeah. It depends yeah. on what the publisher is offering, right. um, and what kind of contract. Yeah. There are contracts now where you are giving up, you know, the book you've written and mm -hmm. any book you're going to write <coughs> for the next ten or twenty years. I you're giving up the. That yeah. And so it was really sad for her. She spent all this time putting this book together and then lost all control over yeah. imagery and. Mm -hmm. Just you know, uh, not her book anymore. So it's, it's so it's, it's sad for her to see it on the shelves. Exactly. Yeah, so you know it, the writer Neil Gaiman. Yeah, he t he did he took I don't know if he does every book, but this way, but he took his uh, American Gods and self published it, added some stuff, added some stuff that the editors had taken out of the first edition, <coughs> and uh, he's one of the you know that story right, Bill? Yeah. yeah. I, I think, I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just, I came here to learn some stuff because I'm an idiot. But, um, <laughs> Did you learn some stuff? No, not yet. Not uh -oh. yet. Um, I'm Megan Price. I do the Vermont Wild series. It's one of the best selling series in Vermont. Oh, oh, yeah. And uh, nice. I do everything totally opposite. I will very briefly tell you here you go, pass it around. <laughs> the reason you know probably you haven't read it or bought it, but you know the covers. I do know. Okay? And uh, Riverdale that. sold a ton of books for me. Thank you very much for these long. I wish you're still there because the ball are by people. Okay, so I did a thing just this winter, which is um, I sell in all Vermont bookstores, like Vermont only, because I don't give a crap about the rest of the world. And uh, I have no intention of going through Ingram or Lulu or Spark or anybody. But you I deliver. I do it all myself. I hire my own artist. It took me three years to find. I work independently with people. I don't have to love them, they have to do what I tell them. And, uh, it's collaborative because I went to the League of Vermont Writers and had the crap scared out of me by a nice man who spent five years working on a book for the World Health Organization on Ebola before it was Ebola. I mean, he knew about all this stuff in the book. And when they did the cover, they said they would collaborate with him and he would be consulted. That was the word, consulted. He was consulted, and they sent a cover that looked like Pepto Bismol <laughs> with cartoon characters on a book that ripped this guy's guts out about the new disease of the day. And 
know, I said, that will never happen to me. Nobody will tell me what to do. I'm too old and I'm too mean. And I'm too independent and I'm going to spend a lot of money doing my books, but I'm going to do it my way. I advertise my books. I only put them out around Christmas. That's when people buy books, Christmas. Okay, so you get the book out around Christmas. Don't put a book out in January, February. You're shooting yourself in the foot. Okay, like, no, this bookstore, God bless you, is dead for three months. They could go to Florida most of the time unless there's something real big happening. So I do things totally different. I have a friend who dresses a lot better than me and is more polite, and she goes around and sells her books and looks like a nun. Okay? So I'm not going to turn down a nun, even when they look at her cross, which is really a bunch of porpoises. They don't know. It's just like, you're not going to tell Sister Mary what the hell to hit the road. And they're going to like, thank you, we'll consider it. And then I, I've had bookstores refuse me, and I run ads in their local paper saying the book is there. Oh. And they have to call me for the book, and it becomes one of their best. Books. <laughs> <laughs> I will go out street corners and sell my book. I will do anything to sell my book because it's friggin' funny. I'm hilarious. One the few days I get out into the world, and it works. So I've sold forty to fifty thousand books in Vermont. Okay, wow. and That's I don't give a crap about Ingram. They will rip you off. All of them do. And you're going to pay for those returns. You're going to pay for every ad. So just do it yourself. I will but be Megan, you're class. hustling. You're you're hustling all the time. You're I'm, working yeah, hard. This is my world. I do nothing else. I have no life. I'm running out the cat because I'm really into this. I don't know why. But when I either eat or write, it's whole hog, obviously. And I just keep at it until I drop. And my phone is shut off. I don't Google. I don't care. I don't want anybody even know where I live. I just do this and then I hide. But now I have a van with little stickers and people find me and go, oh my God, that's you. So it's like being Harper Lee of Vermont, whack job. I try to say no, but it's pretty obvious nobody else looks like this. She dresses this badly. And right now, it has a sticker on her car. Did you I, so I, that's what I do, and I encourage you to find your own shit. But yeah. my thing is to not get taken advantage of by any publishing house, etc. I will be teaching it free, so I'm not making any money. I'm going to teach at the Bixby Library how to get your book out there. Whether you're just writing, I think it's just as valid to write your family stories and mm -hmm. just get them in print for five bucks as it is to spend a billion dollars, and you will pay either way. Whether you go through a traditional publisher, whether you self-publish, it's going to cost you money. It costs me about 15 grand every time to put out every book. And that's nothing for my time, okay? Because I'm real serious about the art and the thing. And, and even then, there's typos, there's crap. I can keep the text right. I just shoot myself. But they're freaking funny. <laughs> yeah. People like dig it and find me. All these woodchucks Do you come in and buy these books. Have Christmas. They have people in the store wearing guns. Oh! And they say, you got that book, and they know what they're talking about, they just push in the book. So, find your own shtick, do it. I'll be at the Bixby Library entertaining every Thursday in April from 7 to, Bixby no, Vermont, I guess. 6 yeah. to 8, something like that. Where, what town is it? That's for gents. It's worth coming to see me, because I'm funny. But some people might walk out, but it's funny anyway, and you have to be an adult. So, if you want to get published, you can do it. And there's good, little, there's good presses here in Vermont, and I've been all over the country working with them. And now I found a really good one right down the street, and uh, they put up with me. And um, they're very fair. If they screw something up, they fix it. And I've had them screw up in the Midwest to the tune of thousands of dollars, and I just walk away. It's like not worth dealing with it. You don't want that to happen. What else the press? Yeah. L. Brown Sons. They got a ten million dollar Heidelberg Press. They got typesetters. I don't like their book cover designers. You got to hunt around. League of Vermont writers, join it. Mm -hmm. Hunt around. You have to vet people. You have to really check what you're doing and get recommendations. So that's it. Well, I won't be appearing here later. But check out the book. <laughs> No, there were yes. more. Oh. I think you've been. Um, yeah, so do, do you have anything to say about piracy? I mean, I should be flattered, right? <laughs> but I don't think it's worth worrying can, about. I can talk to you. <laughs> Go ahead. Piracy only happens mostly in traditional publishing. It costs a lot of money to print a book. Mm -hmm. And I have a good friend who used to be CFO at Random House. and. I was visiting one day and he pulled out, they were so desperate to stop piracy, they started embossing covers, remember that, <laughs> in, in mass market. 
and he pulled out a mass market paperback cover because bookstores and paperbacks only return the cover. And they either pulp or sell the book without a cover. Um, and the, the, pi the pirates had gone to the trouble of just running the covers embossed so they could be returned. But that only happens mm. at the very top level. Piracy at the lower level is just not worth it. Even mid-list writers who sell, you know, 25, 50, 100,000 books, it's not worth pirating their books. Like with the Piragaji handbook, we, we've already planted our flag on the moon. You know, if somebody takes that and copies it and says that we came up with the Piragaji handbook, it's just not defensible. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I don't know. It, it, you're right. It just it is too expensive, as we know. <laughs> I think you had a question. About a thousand. <laughs> Silly me, I thought the hard work was in writing the book. <laughs> and what I know is below the bottom rung of the ladder, way, way below about everything you've been saying. Um, so I'll try to formulate sort of a dual question. Um, can someone t describe what a hybrid publisher is, number one? And number two, um, if one had a, an opportunity to go with a university press, rather than a traditional, you know, label. Is there any advantage to a university press? Are there disadvantages to a university press? A university press is a traditional press. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just in a specific area, usually academic. Yeah. But it's essentially the same as a traditional publisher. It's not a mass market publisher. It's a, a specific. But, but the, these terms really have to do more with the financial deal Mm -hmm. And a university press would usually treat you in the same way as a traditional publisher, but they won't give you as much of it in advance because a lot of them are on their beam edge or they are supported by the university and it's a, it's a brand asset rather than a huge money source. Mm -hmm. Hybrid and assist publishers, it's the sort of the center of the spectrum. They kind of mean the same thing, but it is somebody you can go to who will help you, you know, they will charge you anywhere from $2,000 to $7,000 and lead you through the process and, and they'll work with you on the copy edit, the literary edit, the design, the indicia, all the things that make a book a book. You better love them. Pardon? You better love them. Yeah, yeah, and you need to love them and, and the, Quite frankly, the contract they tender you will tell you everything along with the authors they work with. Mm -hmm. and, and the variable is there are hybrid or assist publishers who will take anybody who bring them money. Mm -hmm. There are other hybrid and assist publishers who will say, I really don't want to take your money. I don't want to take you on unless I think we can actually sell mm -hmm. this book. And there's everything in between. So the comments made earlier about really knowing who you're working with is really critical. Mm -hmm. One thing too about the university press, you might not make as much money, but you might stay in print for a, a lot longer, which might, you know, depends on mm -hmm. whether you care about that. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to think about what your goals are mm -hmm. when you're publishing. That's it, it, because that helps guide you also in terms of the decision making is if, mm -hmm. if, if you think it's going to be beneficial to you in some aspect of your career to be connected with the university press if well, it's if I, or if just I teach personally at the university and it's going to be used for my course yeah maybe that that yeah, yeah. so then right that makes sense yeah. one caveat on, on choosing a press um, I have no value judgment about this, except that I completely understand it. There are four bookstores in Vermont that probably won't even take your book if you do it with CreateSpace. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand why. Um, I have a very good friend who owns a bookstore who said to me one day, how do you feel about a bookstore owner who walks around and asks three, four, five people a day to leave his bookstore? Mm -hmm. And People will come into his bookstore, they'll pull a book off the shelf, they'll open it up, they'll read the, the dust jacket, maybe read you know a few pages, 
stuff it back in, take their cell phone out, scan the barcode, and Amazon will send it to them two days later for five or six dollars less. And they have no shame about that. And the bookstore owner goes up to them and says, you know, I'm really sorry I have to ask you to do this, but I'm not a showroom for Amazon. I have to pay for and stock all these books, and I can't afford to do that for Amazon. Amazon can afford to do that, so I have to ask you to leave, unless you'd like to buy that book. Now think about the complexity of that. So you wonder why there are bookstore owners that have a deep antipathy. They don't have an antipathy to e-books, but the highly predatory way in which Amazon works is really problematic. And bookstores are more than just retail stores, they're community centers. You're all here tonight, you know, this is a community event, and this is what creates community adhesion. So it's just important to have that sensibility. And, and what makes matters worse is Amazon is now establishing brick and mortar stores. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you guys are really bashing on CreateSpace. Mm -hmm. I self published or independently published in 2011 with CreateSpace. Yeah. And I, I've been wanting to come back up and do another book. And because I did it in 2011, is that the only place that I can? You can put it on a lightning source or at Ingram okay. Spire. Yeah, you yeah. can, sure. Okay. You might not get some ex Amazon exclusives. I think it, it changes yeah. all the time, so it I don't really know. It but does. Mm -hmm. You can okay. actually have them in multiple places. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. and recently create, it looks, it's possible that Create Space won't be around much longer. They've been laying off a lot of mm -hmm. okay. employees because they're, they're trying to move people into the KDP. Mm -hmm. Um, platform which offers paperback as well, so you can, mm -hmm. you can, you can have both. You can publish with Ingram Spark, yeah, I'm, and you can publish in in other places as well. And Ingram will put you on Amazon as well. Okay. Well, no, I'm not. Well, I'm not in, yeah. to it. It's just what I did, you know, seven years ago, yeah. and I, I I remember so little about it except the, all the formatting. The one caveat <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I would throw out is if you are with if you're with Ingram, um, and in my case I'm I'm with Lightning Source, I don't let them do my ebooks. I do my ebooks yeah. directly because the revenue that I get from ebook sales is much, much higher than I would get on a pass through from Ingram. So that's just worth looking at. If you want to keep your life easy and you're working with Ingram, then just let them do the whole thing. But if you're looking at margin and it matters to you, pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you stay away from Amazon completely in the four walls? No, not at all. I have an Amazon page. I have the whole thing. I'm just sensitive yeah. you know, to the concern about local bookstores. And my allegiance is primarily to bookstores. I don't write Amazon. I don't you know, do stuff. I want my books on Amazon. I want them on Google, and I want them on Apple. Mm -hmm. um, because there are people who buy them there. But when I go out to do the hard work of marketing, mm -hmm. I pay attention to people in my community. Can you talk a little bit about how you do create your ebooks? Yeah. How do I do create? About how you do create your ebooks? Do you actually create them yourself, or do you? Have no, a I have someone who does it. So that's and I'm exactly very right. focused on the design piece because I do the whole the whole. The, the finished book is done first, so the ebook is created from that design mm -hmm. all the way through. Mm -hmm. So that is um, a technical. What platform is the book created on, so it can export as a yes. ebook? Yes. Yeah. But there's more than one file format for different readers, right? Yes. Yeah, but they should be sort. Of, if, if your book is designed in InDesign, you can export. That's right. And does it go online? Where I mean, you have to. Decide where to put it, or no? There's a process. It? Once you've developed your ebook, there's a process for getting on Google um, and um, iTunes and Amazon and IndieBound. Mm. I mean, when, when people say I want to buy your ebook, I don't send them to Amazon. Right. I send yep. them to IndieBound. Me too. Yeah. People need to know about because there's some revenue sharing with my local bookstore. Yeah. Um, I tell people to. 
order it on indie bound and pick it up at Porter Square Books, <laughs> which is near me. You know, it's kind of a it's a nice way for the it's easy to put the link in and mm -hmm. people can follow it. And it's, the ebook element is something I haven't done, so yeah. getting into the system and getting distributed and easily available mm -hmm. is what. Yeah. Claire, did you do something with ebooks? I mean, Phoenix is really good. Have you done much with the ebooks? We don't do anything with ebooks. Nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Is it too costly? It's just not. It's not going up real big. I mean, it actually sort of crests. Uh, it's right not. It, it's too complicated yeah. and not worth it to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we yeah. feel that. We, we basically at one point had to make a philosophical decision is that what we do is bricks and mortar paper on shelves and that's what we do well and um, the hoops to jump through for ebooks for us I mean we, we can't compete with um, you know the other mm -hmm. options out there it's just it's just not worth it so I will say very briefly I sell all my books I started like 2010 I never discount them in 1995. I don't care if it's new or it's old, and I don't fight with people. I say, read it or not, it's pretty funny. And I'm not discounting it. It's just as much work to, to write it then than it did now, so pick whichever one you want. And B, Bill's absolutely right on the ebook thing. People discount it because it's 99 cents. I refuse that as well. I do sell ebooks on Amazon. They just send me, I look at my checkbook and go, oh, they send me some money, good. But I care. And so, but they're all like half the price of the print book, and I do not sell print books on Amazon. However, bookstores do. There's a bookstore who I will mention that, not this one, that, <laughs> that markets buy books and sells them, and I'm going, how stupid am I? I send them to them, and I get the 40%, I mean, I lose 40%, and now they're selling them mm -hmm. for full, and I sign them for them, so they're selling them for <laughs> Now, what is very oh, fun, once you all become famous authors, and your book will go all over the country and the world, and they'll be selling them used with your signature, sometimes for 40 bucks. That's a really good point. Which when somebody approaches you online line to get their I book signed, yeah. and they want 20 books signed. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> That's kind of offensive. <laughs> Did we have any other questions from the group? I just wanted to say okay. something, which is that what I hear sort of across the board here is that whatever you choose to do, you've made this effort, this beautiful piece, however many pages or whatever it is. So be in alignment with how you carry it out. Mm -hmm. Take the time to mm -hmm. know that that's As great. you go through this whole process, it's working really well for you. It's resonating, resonating as it should be. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, you've done all this work for what? To have it sort of, you know, let the train go off the tracks. It's not worth it. This is your huge project. Make it a joy. That was the train going off the tracks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Can I also just mention that I um, am hoping to offer a workshop here locally? Um, it's not going to be nearly as hysterically fun as the Bixby <laughs> Library. <laughs> but, um, I have some flyers here if people are interested. Basically what I'm doing right now is just taking some names and having people indicate what um, Saturdays in April and May they might be available for. I'm going to do it hopefully at the Senior Center here in Montpelier. Um, yeah, I could do it also in, in, I don't know if there are people who came here from Hardwick. Somebody said they came from Hardwick, but um, mm -hmm. I could offer it somewhere else if there was, if there was interest um, as well. But there are flyers here. It's basically something that's going to be a full day of looking at from kind of soup to nuts, deciding how to choose what you need to do, what the, you know, what the distribution channels are, what the different cover design principles are and layout principles, nice. ebooks, marketing, all, you know, sort of just the whole gamut of things to, to be thinking about. So if you're interested, there are flyers here and you don't, this implies no obligation if you put your name and your email address. It's just kind of trying to get a sense of, of people who might be interested. Did everyone get one of these? Um, the independent publishers, is, anytime you come to one of our live events, we, um, it's half price membership. So, what's that? They, I think they all have them. Everybody they all have them? Yes. Okay. This is a good time for me to say that um, take a look at all the information in your packets. Feel free to look at the extra information at the table. As Catherine said, she has a flyer about her upcoming workshop. Um, the panelists are here for a few more moments if people want to approach them with individual questions. And, the door. Um, and then we'll be sending out a survey and if you have any feedback for us, we'd love it as well. And their books. And their books are here. Um, we have Catherine's books, we have Bill's books. 
um, we have a book from um, Charlotte's Press, it's a new children's book, so please do check those out. Nice. Thank you for coming. Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.